please stand and join in welcoming the dean, faculty, distinguished guests, and the, the 2015 graduating class of the University of Chicago, Irving B. Harris School of Public Policy. My name is Douglas Geiger, and I'm the Director of Student Affairs at the Harris School of Public Policy. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you today as we award degrees to our 2015 Harris School of Public Policy graduates. I would like to first introduce Jeremy Edwards, Senior Associate Dean for Student and Academic Affairs, who would like to share some thoughts with our graduates today. Jeremy. Graduates, I know what you're thinking. That is the baggiest thing I've ever seen Jeremy wear, ever. <laughs> I asked for a skinny fit robe, but apparently they don't make them. So this is the best I can do with. So today is indeed a day of celebration, a day to acknowledge fully your accomplishment. You're now a member of an exclusive group of individuals that are well-trained, motivated, ambitious, hungover, <laughs> yet more importantly, fearless. Today you will hear certainly things like, congratulations, well done, you did it. Felicidades, aumentito, conchi, and so forth and so forth. I could probably do it in 15 languages, but I'll, I'll save you the, the pain. Of all these things that you'll hear today, all of them are truly important and valuable to you, no doubt. However, the most important words you will hear today will be the words that you tell yourself. I'm sure that you woke up this morning, assuming that you even went to sleep, how this, is one, how this graduation is any different than all the previous ones, your high school, your undergraduate, perhaps your first or second or third or fourth masters. And in that internal conversation that you had with yourself, you're searching for something to distinguish this moment from all the others. And there's an assumption, perhaps, that my work here is done and that you've crossed the finish line. 
When you made the decision to invest your time, your money, your life in social sciences, you also made the parallel decision to forever believe that your work is never done. There will always be someone in need. There will always be a better way. There will always be problems to solve. For all that I know and all that I can offer you, I'm here to remind you that starting today, your work actually begins. So let that be the message you tell yourself today. My work begins today. So on behalf of my colleagues, faculty, administration, and alumni, I urge you to pursue the most difficult problems facing the world today. Look for them, find them, run to them full speed ahead with vigor and fearlessness because the world needs more people like you. Now go and make not just me and my colleagues proud, but each other proud. So in true Chicago Harris tradition each year, we invite one of our outstanding alumni to return to campus and address our new graduates. This year, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome back Dan Tangerlini, Harris class of 1991. I'll only touch on a few highlights of his career since graduating from Harris, but you can find a more complete bio in your programs. It's quite long. Dan has had an extensive and impressive career as a public, service, as a public servant at both the local and federal levels, and most recently in the private sector. Over the years, Dan has served in the Office of Management and Budget, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and held several positions within the executive branch of Washington, D.C.'s government, including the position of city administrator and deputy mayor for the district. He has served as, he has served as the chief financial officer at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he was a principal policy advisor in the execution of the budget and performance plans. In 2013, Dan was nominated by President Barack Obama to serve in the position of administrator for the General Services Administration, where he introduced new technologies, data-driven decision-making, and much more. Currently, Dan serves as the chief operating officer and principal for Artemis Real Estate Partners, a real estate investment management firm located in the DC area. Dan is also a graduate of the college, and at some point within his incredible year, found time to earn this thing called an MBA at a small business school in Pennsylvania named Wharton. Dan lives in DC with his family. We are grateful that he's carved out time to be with us today, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Dan Tangerlini. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Edwards, for that uh, generous introduction. Dean Dormeyer, faculty, administration, students, and most importantly, friends and family, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you here today on this very important occasion. Um, it's particularly uh, uh, nice for me to be back here in Mandel Hall. Um, this is where we had all the concerts when I was here at the college. And, and while the band has done a fantastic job this morning, I do have to remember uh, when Public Enemy, the tremendous uh, hip hop uh, uh, out of the box uh, band uh, stopped. Uh, yes, Public Enemy um, stopped their power uh, song, uh, Fight the Power, uh, to actually engage in a dialogue with the students of the University of Chicago over uh, engagement in the community, uh, equality, and other interesting issues. That could only happen in Mandel Hall and at the University of Chicago. But it's an honor to be here, and Harris has been very generous in honoring me. In fact, just last year, I was honored to be the inaugural recipient of one of two awards given to Harris alumni. And I'll admit at the time, I was a little bit sensitive, perhaps overly sensitive, about the fact that I did not win the Rising Star Award. Uh, I had won the Career Achievement Award, which, when juxtaposed to the Rising Star Award, uh, made me feel, you know, kind of old. Um, but this morning, uh, I don it proudly today because with age comes wisdom, or so I'm told. And it is this wisdom that I've been asked to impart to you today. I comfort myself knowing that rising stars seldom give graduation addresses. Now this is the third time I've given a, an address to a graduating class. The first time was in 2001 or so when I was asked by DC Mayor Williams to give a speech at the graduation of the Sharp Health Elementary School for Disabled Children. And I'm not sure there was anything I said that was nearly as inspiring as the very presence at that ceremony of some of those kids given the profound challenges that they had overcome. 
My next opportunity, actually, was last year at the commencement ceremony for the Wharton Executive MBA program, which I won't speak much more about, but I tried hard to use the event as an opportunity to encourage the graduating class to find some time in their careers to make a difference through public service. However, my exhortations were hampered by an unexpected fluke of demography. You see, the class of 2014 had set a record for the number of babies that had been brought into the world by the class members. And during the program, something close, uh, during that program, it was something close to 25. They were all there at the event. <laughs> and here is an apparently never before known fact. Um, babies do not like Adlai Stevenson. <laughs> or so it seems, because somewhere about a third of the way into my remarks, I quoted Adlai Stevenson, and all 25 of the babies simultaneously began to cry. And I'd have to say it was a little distracting, off-putting, and perhaps some of the uh, powerful message I was trying to make was lost that morning. So three's a charm, right? And I've learned uh, through this experience that the big takeaway from those uh, events is brevity. Uh, you're done with school, you want to get on with your lives, and I should try to stop talking very quickly. But before I do, let me give you three tips I picked up along the, my path. So Harris is a quant school. It has taught you to monetize, evaluate, plot, regress, and crunch. These are important skills out there. Big data is a real thing. Knowing how to wade into data, being comfortable with it, seeking it out, and crunching it up is your differentiator. You will be extremely valuable because of this skill. Let people know you have it. Flaunt it. However, like any superpower, be careful that you don't begin to think it's the answer to all problems. Remember. Aquaman isn't great for a grease fire. <laughs> I have some personal experience with this trap of data and empiricism. When I was serving as the interim general manager of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, or Metro, we were trying to dramatically improve the focus on customer service. One day, a couple of senior members of the uh, operations team and I were discussing the means by which the organization determined customer satisfaction when one of them mentioned with some pride that we had ha had the latest monthly customer complaint data. He was particularly happy because it had shown a sizable reduction from the month prior, some very specific number like 27 or 34 percent. When I asked what the month over month gross change was, he stated that we had gone from 53 to 39 complaints. Impressive, I thought, but I then asked what I thought also was a logical qualifying question, given that the system served a combined one million riders daily on bus and rail. I asked if the unit of measure was thousands. He said no. We had had roughly three dozen registered complaints the entire prior month. This wasn't possible. I, I, I had just taken over the transit system, and I knew later that evening I was going to wade through over 100 complaints on my unpublished email. So we then discussed a simple question. How does one actually lodge a complaint with the transit authority? And the answer made it pretty clear what was actually wrong. Each separate rail line, red, green, yellow, et cetera, and the bus system had their own customer feedback phone number. And neither the head nor the of uh, rail or bus uh, operations or scheduling who were there actually had any idea what that number was. So this was 2006, uh, the year before the iPhone was introduced. So there was no easy way to Google the, the number while you were experiencing a system issue or an app which you could register your com concern. It was already hard to complain to Metro, and we had made it dramatically harder. To be honest, I was actually kind of surprised that we had the 40 to 50 complaints that we had. But more importantly, the smart, thoughtful people who were studying the data had fallen for a trap. They didn't challenge the quality or the means of collecting the data they were using to make these decisions. They had celebrated changes in percentages without questioning the absolute quantities. And you'll see this time and time again. In fact, sometimes history, politics, habit, record keeping, and culture can make a perfectly rational assumption supported by data in a, impossible, inappropriate, and unimplementable. Your incredible data analysis skills need to be complemented by an awareness of these limitations. So tip one, be a data maven, not a numerologist. This tip is particularly important because the world is actually quite complicated. 
It's not as logical and organized as a data set, a well-researched article or survey might suggest, and frankly, you would hope. This is a mistake I constantly make. For much of the time I've done my work, I assumed intent, careful planning, thoughtful strategy, even cunning was behind every action or situation I confronted. I had a habit of assuming the worst case scenario, uh, expected situations that would spin wildly out of control and smell doom lurking around each bureaucratic corner. It means that I can't, I can't count on one hand the number of times I've actually been shocked by an outcome, but this approach comes at a very, very high cost of stress. More and more, I found that if you actually assume omission rather than commission, you're probably more likely correct, much more likely, in fact, to have guessed the actual underlying cause of the situation. That is to say that very, very few people come to work bent on doing something horrible or exacting some painful consequences on you, not even in Congress. I have observed that most bad outcomes happen by mistake or because something thought was going to be good turned out bad, or they got distracted, they were out sick, forgot to unplug the coffee maker, disconnected that wire to that annoying alarm thing, and I can't tell you how many times that's actually happened. We're distracted by a cell phone, had a fight with a spouse, never should have been hired in the first place. You get the idea. So I guess the second tip is House of Cards is a fun show, but it's not real life. Be patient, forgiving, and humane. If it went wrong, it was probably a mistake, a misunderstanding, or a miscommunication. Real life is, a sort, of, is sort of random and compu complicated, not formulaic and planned. The essential truth was the foundation of the advice given to me by UFC professor Terry Nichols Clark, who convinced me to abandon my plans to go to urban planning school and instead stay here and go to the Harris School. It was Professor Clark who summed up the value of a public policy degree better than I have heard anyone else do since. He also did it in a way that I've made sure to share with every one of my friends and acquaintances who did get a planning degree. He told me that planning is a 19th century notion. We're not building cities anymore. We're living in them and trying to make them work. That's public policy. DC Mayor Tony Williams, who I worked under for nearly eight years, said it slightly different. He once told me, to plan is human, to implement divine. Which is my third and mercifully last tip. Be an implementer, do stuff, the world needs action. While seemingly the simplest bit of advice, I found this exhortation the hardest to do and to get people to do. The sad fact is that society, and particularly our government institutions, places a high value on not making mistakes. A solid, respected, reasonably cons uh, compensated and secure career can be built by simply carrying forward what was already happening when you got there. Even when you're recruited as a change agent, and I've been told by people hiring me that they wanted someone who's not afraid to make the necessary changes, the natural human reaction is to resist, fear, or question change. When I was director of the District of Columbia Department of Transportation, I saw this tendency in stark relief. Neighborhoods would complain loudly about a situation, but inevitably more loudly about a suggested solution. Therefore, it often felt that the only thing worse than the status quo is change. But we live in a society where the off-sighted and somewhat trite expression of the inevitability of change is taking place at a speed not seen since the first industrial revolution. Reach into your pocket and take out, or if you're a couple of folks I can see from up here, just look harder at, your smartphone. That little doodad is only eight years old. And already it's become a vital organ for at least one generation of humans. I can't tell you how many times my daughters have told me they would die if they lost their cell phone. <laughs> and depending on how you count, we're already on the sixth iteration of that most popular model. How many processes and systems in government have changed at all? Never mind that that's a kind of Moore's Law type level of speed. And yet we need to change the way government interacts with its customers or else risk an even wider gulf opening between the people and the institutions that serve them. That requires action and courage and dedication, a willingness to take risks, speak truth to power, and lean in. You have been given the tools, the superpower. You're thoughtful and aware, and now you simply need to have the courage, born of the confidence and competence your Harris School training has provided for you to just go for it and make things happen. Congratulations on your accomplishment and your valuable degree. 
You have a power I know that you will use thoughtfully, recognizing the complexity of the world and the, uh, the fallibility of people, to take action and make a difference. I'm proud to be able to welcome you to the important growing society of graduates of this fine institution. You're all rising stars. I look forward to your career achievements. Thank you for your patience and your limited crying. And now call upon Dean Daniel Derrimeyer and the designated faculty and staff that are here to present, to assist with the presentation of degrees today. Dean Dierermeyer, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Arts by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have conferred upon you the degree of Master of Arts, and I express the hope that your work will improve our understanding of public policy. Congratulations. Leah Rainsford Calvo. <laughs> Chi Dong. <laughs> Kazim Oluwale Ahmed. E. E. He. <laughs> Chin Ja Dri. Dean Dierermeyer, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policies and the Division of Physical Sciences. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Science by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have compared upon you the degree of Master of Science and expressed the hope that your work will improve our understanding of public policy. Congratulations. Adriana Shaconi. Theodore Kalchitsky. Dean Dierermeyer, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Public Policy by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have conferred upon you the degree of Master of Public Policy and expressed the hope that your work will guide public policy towards the enhancement of the common good. Congratulations. Alfonso Amaya Para. <laughs> David Thomas Applegate. Andre Ar Aravalo Arroyo. Yeah. 
And I, my apologies, one, I, I skipped one candidate, Jennifer Guy. Yusuki Arita. Christopher Michael Rhymes. Eric Avilas Herrera. Michael Esmera. <laughs> Mohammed Fessel Ali Bag. Antonia Kate Bernhardt. Constance Elizabeth Boozer. Nora Catherine Buashi. Kristen Bretz. Melissa Lynn Brown. <laughs> Catherine Maria Buitrago. Laura Lee Price Burks. <laughs> Jessica Caballero. <laughs> Zeng Yu Chao. Corey Jillian Chen. Enrique Cesaro Acosta. Ken Zhao Chen. <laughs> Tino Lindsay Chitiga.
Ji Young Chow. Robert James Tunlisk. Routing Day. <laughs> Benio Almante Terramente. Mary Desmond. <laughs> Maria Fernanda Diaz de la Vega Garcia. Owen Stephen Dillon. <laughs> Micah Donald Dos. <laughs> Jordan A. Durrett. Sean Finley Edwards. <laughs> Simone Elizabeth Facey. Leslie Faith. <laughs> Tangela Sharice Nicole Feemster Therian. Kazua Fukuhara. <laughs> Luis Clark Garrity. <laughs> Gregory Gillette. Jonathan Jufrida. <laughs> Sha Gong. <laughs> Eugene Hon. Mary Charlotte Hanley. <laughs> Yumi Haramoto.
Kazuhiro Hayashi. Cheryl Ann Healy. <laughs> Daniel K. Hertz. <laughs> James Coleman Howes. Ryan Evans Huffman. <laughs> Kiera Renee Hughes. David Andres Ibanez Para. <laughs> Zainab Imam. Sitao Washington John. Esperanza Johnson. Takayuki Kanai. Hongbo Kang. <laughs> Mamut Kara. Parul Karna. <laughs> Swaichiro Kishino. <laughs> Lara Katan. Sharon Kim. <laughs> Ho Min Kim. <laughs> Anne Michelle Kanapke. Joyce Lam. <laughs> Bernice H. Lee.
Beatrice Lee. <laughs> Katrina Leigh Lewis. Hong Feng Lu. <laughs> See you, Lu. Bofe Ma. <laughs> Susan Chadwick Malani. <laughs> Derek Mann. Sona Margayan. <laughs> Maxim Markovich. <laughs> Laura Alyssa Martin. Carla Angela Elizabeth McLean. <laughs> Thong Min. Laura C. Mayer. <laughs> Jamie Mize. Martha Montiel Siegler. Adam Douglas Nation. Luis Navarro. Kimberly Laith Norman. Yeah. Michelle Nigren. Brian Paul O'Connor. <laughs> Maria M Marissa Christine O'Donnell. Daniel Patrick O'Keefe. <laughs> Hi.
Heidi Ortolaza Alvear. Aida Pacheco. Maria Claudia Pereira Para. Andres C. Perez Morales. Lauren Michelle Pett. Tatiana Filipova. Mati Elizabeth Prodonovic. Anum Kadir. Andrew Rank. <laughs> Tumpkin out Ralph. <laughs> Chase Thomas Raywinkle. Matthew Kanichi Repka. <laughs> Santiago Reyes Ortega. <laughs> Tiago Rivera Dos Santos. Michael Brandon Riley. <laughs> Lena Rossi. Sarah Melaine Sayevsky. <laughs> Miss Suzu Sheck Snyder. Raquel Maria Segundo. Sarah Faye Center. Yaji Seng. <laughs> Ma
Nazia Adil Sadiqi. Brian Christopher Sills. Amelia Snowblin. <clears throat> Fiorelli Margarita Squadrito Herrera. Christine Joan Stirrett. Sierra Rebecca Stoney. Chi Swin. Kenneth Sunderason. <laughs> Scarlett Swerdlow. Chao Tan. <laughs> D Tan. <laughs> Michael Thompson. Mayumi Tomita. <laughs> Robert Lauren Veneste. Mary Catherine Wagoner. <laughs> Natalia J. Wallen. Ju Wan. <laughs> Su Sha Wan. <laughs> Yoin Chi Wan. Sarah Elise Wassertail. <laughs> Asa Watton. Aaron C. Watts. Shannon Michelle White. <laughs> I 
Wandi Wei Dianto. Wendy Wong. Giovanni Antan Marziani Robo. Len Sha. Wen Jin Shi. Major Yu. Shu Yu Ah Yu. Dean Deremeyer, the students I now present have attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Philosophy as confirmed by the Board of Trustees. The trustees have conferred upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, and I welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Congratulations. Dr. Laura Sartain. Dr. Konji Son Jo. Class of 2015, Harrow School graduates, congratulations. <laughs> On a day of graduation, it's, uh, it's time to look forward, it's time to look back a little bit, and I think it's also time to acknowledge all of, them, all of our loved ones that have helped us to get to this proud day. Our moms, our dads, our brothers, our sisters, our grandma, grandpa, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today on this very special day and to join us as we welcome the new generation of Harris graduates. This is a proud day. You've accomplished a lot. Uh, you've also been through a lot. This has not been easy. 
Uh, we pride ourselves to have to be the most fun school, but also the most challenging. <laughs> and uh, you may remember those days when you came here, and uh, the first thing you were confronted with was math boot camp, and you asked yourself, what did I get myself into here? And then there was the core, uh, long nights with, with problem sets that had to be worked through, uh, stressful exams, hopefully some support uh, from, from your fellow students, uh, from your professors. And, uh, well, and then things just kind of moved to the next step. And now after two years, and in the case of our PhD students, a few years longer, you're here with us and celebrate that day. And during those years, you may have asked yourself at some point, there may have been that little icicle of doubt. Is it really, was that really worth it? Did I really make the right decision? Isn't there an easier way to get where I want to go? And of course, you know what the answer will be. Absolutely not. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way we pride ourselves when we think about educating the next generation of public policy leaders. We believe that in order to be able to make a difference in the world, you need enthusiasm, you need the drive to move things forward, you need the dedication, but you also need the tools to figure out what's best for society and for getting it done. As you've heard from Dan in his, in his remarks earlier today, we are the Quant School. We pride ourselves as the most analytically rigorous curriculum that you can find in the area of public policy. And that belief is based on the values of the University of Chicago, its dedication to rigorous inquiry, and its commitment to creating and furthering knowledge for social good. While the methods may change, where the particular approaches may come and go, where we may now enter the new world of technology and big data, those things may change, and this is certainly an area and a time of tremendous change. The core values that this school stands for will stay the same. Yes, we are in the leadership education business. Our goal is to develop and educate the next generation of leaders that will make a difference. But we want the right kind of leaders. We want those leaders that put evidence first, that figure out what's best for society and get it done. As you embark on your new chapter, as you embark on your new career, I'd like you to keep those values in mind and to think about how do you take them, how do you take the commitment, how do you take the tools and the education that you have enjoyed, maybe from time to time not so much enjoyed, but at least experienced at the Harris School and make a difference in the world. You're now graduates of the Harris School. You're now graduates of the University of Chicago. You are our legacy. You are our ambassadors. You are members now of the Harris faculty, and we're awfully proud to have you. Congratulations. This concludes the official part of the ceremonies, but I all in, uh, would invite you now to join us at a reception. Um, we hope you stay with us to celebrate this special day. Again, thank you very much for coming and congratulations.